I'm wondering, how many of you have ever seen the movie Home Alone? I mean, that goes back a ways, right? Um, that movie is going on, I think, 30 years old. Can you imagine that it's been around uh, nearly for 30 years? Uh, but Home Alone is a, a movie about an eight-year-old, Kevin McAllister, played by... Okay, so uh, I'm gonna get I thought I saw more hands than people who knew uh, who the main character was. Yeah, Macaulay Culkin, who um, is inadvertently left behind when his family leaves for uh, vacation over Christmas. Now, I do want to say that you, you, maybe you're thinking, why is, he, why is he talking about a Christmas movie to open up uh, a sermon on Mother's Day? But, but let me just say, like, is Home Alone not about a mother and her selfless love chasing down her son, right? I mean, okay, so we can, we can take it that way. But anyway, um, really, it's a movie about a kid who is left behind by his parents, and so the, the mother really does do everything that she can to, to find her son. But in the meantime, in the meantime, Kevin's left at home, and he uh, is pretty wise uh, for an eight-year-old uh, because as two uh, would-be uh, burglars try to burglarize their house, he conco- concocts this um, just massive plan, um, ingenious plan, uh, to thwart their, their efforts. And there's a scene in the movie where Kevin uh, wanders into a church, and, and he wanders into this church, and, and it's like this big cathedral-like church, and there's this choir singing, and, and he goes in, and he, he sits down, and he looks over, and he sees across the aisle uh, from him his neighbor, who is, is his name Old Man Marley? I, I cannot remember. Some, one of you will correct me afterward if it's wrong. Um, but anyway, Old Man Marley is, is sitting there in the seat, and Old Man Marley has this reputation. In fact, just before the family left on vacation, uh, Kevin's older brother tells this terrible story about Old Man Marley, and so Kevin is just so, so afraid of Old Man Marley. But out of nowhere, Old Man Marley gets up, and he crosses the aisle, and he goes and he sits down next to Kevin. And in this heartfelt exchange, Old Man Marley, I think, speaks some words that are so true to life. He says this, how you feel about your family is a complicated thing. And then he continues, deep down, you'll always love them. You can forget that you love them, and you can hurt them, and they can hurt you, and that's not just because you are young. Let me say it again. You can forget that you love them, and you can hurt them, and they can hurt you, and that's not just because you are young. I would imagine that in one way or another, you've experienced that firsthand. If not in your family, then you've experienced through a friendship, You've experienced that perhaps in a relationship with a coworker or someone you've gone to school with. Um, but you know as well as I that we live in a world that is a lot like the world that uh, Kevin McAllister was living in and Old Man Marley as well. What I didn't mention in the story about Old Man Marley was that leading up to those heartfelt words, he actually shared how he was estranged from his family, how there was some conflict that had taken place and it wasn't handled in a very uh, healthy or redemptive sort of way. And yet, Old man Marley realizes that all of us have the capacity within us to hurt one another, that, that we end up getting hurt and we end up hurting other people. And sometimes it's in our families and sometimes it's in our friendships or sometimes it's among the people we go to school with or people that we work with or people that we live in close proximity to. Broken relationships are everywhere and we all need those relationships to be rehabbed. That, that all of us have within us some sort of brokenness that, that causes us to, to actually hurt other people. And, and all of us have been hurt by other people's brokenness. And so we can't escape conflict. But what if we could become more careful in how we handle conflict? And what if we could become more careful in how we handle the aftermath of conflict? So last week we talked about what to do in conflict. This week we're going to talk a little bit about what to do on the other side of conflict. And the good news is this, that God knew that we would struggle with conflict. And so God has built into his word truth after truth after truth to help us handle conflict, not just in a healthy way, but actually in a redemptive way. Because what we do in the midst of conflict matters, but what we do on the other side of conflict matters as well. And might even, you could build a case that what we do on the other side of conflict matters more. 
And so in this installment of, of our Proverbs series, Relationship Rehab, we're answering that question. So what do we do on the other side of conflict? What do we do when there's a conflict in our relationship, in our marriage, with our parents, with our kids? What do we do when there's a, a conflict among our extended family members? What do we do when there's a conflict among the people that we work with or we go to school with or we go to church with? What do we do when it's our offense? What do we do when it's our turn to forgive? What do we do when we need the forgiveness. And the good news is there's some wisdom that answers all of those questions. And that's the wisdom we're going to focus on this morning. So join me in Proverbs 14.9. We'll go uh, proverb by proverb. We'll talk a little bit about what it means, and then we'll talk about how it, it, it's played out in your relationships and in my relationships as well. So 14.9 says that fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. Now, you can apply this proverb to someone's relationship with God and, and someone sins against God. You can also apply this proverb to someone sins against other people. People sins against you, your sins against, against other people. Both are appropriate applications. But the reality is this, that, that fools never apologize for their foolishness. And so there's a wise way and there's a foolish way. And we see that in every one of these proverbs. And, and, and the Maybe you found this. The, the wise way isn't usually the way that comes most natural for us. Um, the wise way is actually the way that, that um, it's maybe a little more difficult. Like there's the high road and there's the low road and the foolish way is the low road and the wise way is the high road. And, and this is why, friends, we, we need the good news of the gospel, right? This is why we need to, to live these Proverbs out with the Holy Spirit fueling us. It's, it only comes through our, our, our faith in, in Jesus. But this proverb is so true that fools really have a hard time apologizing for their foolishness. It doesn't matter if it's against God. It doesn't matter if it's against people. This is just kind of the way people are. And, and I'm wondering if, if you've ever met someone who had an awfully hard time apologizing. Maybe you met some, have met someone, or maybe you can be this way yourself, um, that, that apologies are really, really difficult. They, they just don't come easy. People struggle with apologizing, I think, for a variety of reasons. But I think two of the biggest reasons why people struggle with apologizing and why the foolish way seems like the best way to a lot of people is that one, apologizing takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to be able to say that you were wrong. It takes a lot of courage to, to, to be vulnerable enough to say that you didn't get it right in that particular situation. But the other reason apologizing is hard is because it takes a lot of humility. And a lot of us really struggle with humility. We're more prideful than we'd like to think that we are. And so in a lot of ways, apologies are hard for some people because we have a hard time lowering ourselves or we have a hard time sort of seeing that person that we are in conflict with on, on our level. And um, it becomes really difficult because we default toward um, our lack of courage or will default to our lack of humility and will choose the foolish way. But fools actually mock that idea of making amends for sin. They mock at the idea of, of, of owning their sin. And, and sometimes we, we, we don't do the all out foolish thing. Like sometimes it's not that we, we just don't make amends for sin, but sometimes what we do is we say, well, I'm sorry, but, and then we'll insert something, right? So, so we're not like a straight up fool. We're just sort of like a kind of fool. But who wants to be a kind of fool? Like that doesn't sound really good either. And none of us want that. But that's sort of the game that we play in half-hearted apologies. And I think, you know, some of you are, are kind of uh, chuckling to yourself. And, and, and I, I saw some, some, some elbowing here and there. And so you understand that, that a lot of people find apologizing really difficult. But, but making amends for sin, uh, a, a real apology, if you will, is, is owning our sin, owning our sin against God, owning our sin against someone else. And so the way to be wise is actually making amends for that sin. And so here's the practical truth that this proverb points us to. If you and I want to be careful in conflict, if you and I want to have relationships on the other side of conflict that, that are actually healthier, if we want to handle conflict in a redemptive way, then we need to be able to own our failures toward one another. And according to this proverb, if, if, if you, you look at its, its truth there, um, you'll see that owning our part in the conflict, owning our sin, making amends for that failure. It's actually a powerful piece of that, that healing that comes on the other side of conflict. It actually creates an environment in that relationship or an environment of goodwill. And all of us want that kind of relationship. 
All of us want relationships that are are life-giving. And so we work to create the kind of uh, relational environment where goodwill is present. And here's how we do it. We keep our hearts soft toward God and toward the people that we're in relationship with. And so as we bring this to life and as we, we drive it home and apply it to our own lives, I'm wondering if you find it difficult to own your sins and your failures when you're in conflict with other people? Do you struggle with owning your part of a conflict? Do you struggle at times with seeing your part in a conflict? And what might God be saying to you about that? See, again, there's, there's a, a way that seems really easy, but almost always it's the way of foolishness. The hard thing to do is swallow our pride. The hard thing to do is be courageous. The hard thing to do is to own our sin, but it's the wise way, it's the better way, and it's actually in conflict, the redemptive way. So, so do you find it easy to apologize or do you struggle? And then um, let, let's do this. Do you find it easy to apologize or to own your sin with God or do you struggle with that? And I'm wondering if there might be a connection there as we apply this proverb in, in, in both ways. Because in a lot of ways, when our hearts are soft toward God, they will also be soft toward other people. And if there's a difficulty in apologizing to people, it might be rooted in a more spiritual sort of issue between you and me, you know, between us and and God. And how can you and I, applying this wisdom, uh, choosing humility, choosing to courageously uh, confront our weaknesses and own our weaknesses and own our failures, how can that create that kind of relational environment of goodwill? How can that be a life-giving influence, not just in your life, but in that uh, relationship? See, I think all of us want that environment of goodwill. All of us want life-giving relationships. It's just that we're not always willing to work for it. We want it, but we don't work for it. And so, again, own your failures toward one another. But when we talk about rehabbing our relationships, there's a lot of, of, of difficult truth that, that we need to confront. And there's a lot of difficult pieces of our, own, of our own hearts and a lot of rough edges that the truth of God's word confronts. And, and that also uh, comes through in the next proverb, in Proverbs 17, 17, where it says there a friend loves at all times and a brother or sister is born for adversity. And of all the, the three Proverbs that we're talking about today, this one is probably the, the most popular or this one is the most um, uh, like well-known uh, that there is the kind of friend who loves at all times. Um, in fact, that is the definition of a, a friend. It's describing the kind of friend that, that uh, all of us want and too few people ever get to experience. It's the kind of friend who loves and leans into the relationship in good times and in difficult times. It's the kind of friend that, that believes the best about us and not the worst about us when there's a conflict, when there's a misunderstanding, when there's a bump in the road or a challenge. It's the kind of friend who, who loves us when we're hard to love. And how many of us here have ever been hard to love? And those of you who aren't raising your hand just don't know it. Um, it's the kind of friend who also uh, is present when we're at our lowest. But as we've been talking about, relationships really can be tough because anytime we have relationships, you have two broken, sinful people who are uh, living in relationship with each other. And, and the fact is... Um, we can be fickle friends at times. We can be fickle family members and we can be fickle co-workers. And sometimes what happens is when, when hard times come, uh, we take steps away from each other in, in those hard situations. When life is busy, when life is challenging, when someone's maybe too demanding, where the relationship is too inconvenient, when there's a, a misunderstanding in, in some way, we, we start to take steps away. But a friend lives, loves in all times, even when... Uh, there's a challenge, and even when the other person is, is hard to love. And what I love about this proverb is it points us to Jesus, that we don't view the Proverbs as, as something that we just do apart from the work of Jesus in our hearts. It's the work of Jesus that helps us to live these Proverbs out in this life-changing, life-giving sort of a way. And if you and, and I try to live this truth out apart from the gospel, again, we've entered into moralism. And so, so really, who is the friend who's shown us how to love at all times? It's Jesus himself. Jesus is the source of this. And you think about Jesus, the perfect son of God. He came to earth. And, and who did he spend time 
time with, he spent time with imperfect people. He spent time with broken people. He spent time with people who, who disappointed him. He, he spent time with people who would end up betraying him. He spent time with people who were immature. He spent time with people who were difficult. He spent time with people who were even downright dangerous. After all, you think of his friend Judas, right, who, who would betray him and ended up, uh, ended up having Jesus in a lot of ways, ended up having him crucified. And maybe, just maybe, don't miss this, maybe, just maybe, we'd be better able to build these kind of friendships if we would learn to see each other and learn to see all of our relationships and all those people through the lenses of Jesus. And you think about Jesus and, and, and his living out of this particular proverb, uh, he didn't condone the sins of, of, of people, right? Right? Like he didn't say that, that people's behavior was okay, but he also didn't shy away from the messes that they were in. But what do we do at times? Like we do one of two things too often, that sometimes we, we end up just sort of uh, condoning, you know, everyone else's behavior, or we end up also kind of letting the pendulum swing the other way where we run away from people when they, they need us and they need the love of Jesus the, the most. But Jesus entered into the messiness of relationships. He entered into that, that tension that, that all of us have, have lived in and, and lived with. And what Jesus did is he loved at all times. And so there's two kinds of adversity here because it talks about here how a brother or a sister is born for, for adversity. There's adversity that comes from outside the relationship. There's adversity that comes through no work of yours and no work of mine. Adversity that comes from the outside that challenges the relationship. How did Jesus handle adversity that came from outside the relationship? Well, Jesus leaned into the relationship. Jesus actually um, was present in the relationship. So you think about adversity that came from the outside. Think of the example of Jesus' friend Lazarus. He dies, right? And, and as Lazarus dies, Jesus goes and he comforts Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, who were also good friends of Jesus. Jesus leaned into the relationship when adversity came from the outside. He, he made his presence known. He took steps toward them. And so when adversity comes, I think there's something we can learn. But before we talk about that, let's, let's talk also about adversity that comes from the inside, adversity that comes from the people who are living in that relationship. What does this look like? It looks like when, when someone sins against us, that is adversity that comes from inside the relationship. It's not um, adversity that, that just sort of happened. It's adversity that, that, that happened through your effort and, and, and mine or because of your effort and, and mine. So you think about how Jesus handled that adversity from the inside. Jesus had a good friend who was part of his inner circle of three. It was Peter. And when Jesus needed Peter the most, Peter ended up denying Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And so on Easter Sunday, we talked about how Jesus is able to redeem all of our failures. And as proof, we looked at in John chapter 21, Jesus taking a step toward Peter, even though Peter had denied him, Jesus showing up in Peter's life and reinstating him. As, as a friend and really as a committed follower of his. Jesus leaned into the relationship when adversity happened uh, from the inside. And so what can we learn from both kinds of adversity? How can we live the truth of this proverb out? The, the first is this, when adversity comes from the outside, when there are circumstances beyond our control and, and life is sort of happening to that person that we're in relationship with, we can be like Jesus and be there. We should be like Jesus and be there. We show up, we check in, we offer encouragement. We do something that's practical, something that's helpful. We let them know that they are not alone, just as Jesus let Mary and Martha know that they were not alone. What do we do when there's adversity that comes from inside the relationship? The adversity that comes because two people are working together or are living together or who are uh, just in close proximity to one another. What do you do when that person that you're in relationship with disappoints you? What do we do when that person that, that we live in relationship with fails us? What do we do when that, that person that we live in relationship fails to, meet our ex, fails to meet our expectations? We do what Jesus did when it was his turn to deal with that internal kind of adversity, and we believe the best about the other person. And so I just want to illustrate that in, in a very simple way. And so today, I need some volunteers. I know, people get all... Jaden! Come on, Jaden, come on up. We'll take Jaden. Who else? We got Mandy. Come on up, Mandy. We need one more. I want one over 40, though. I need a volunteer over 40. 
Look, they all just stare. Look at that. <laughs> no volunteers over 40? Not a one. Reba, you're always good to volunteer. <laughs> oh, you're not 40. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I forgot I had said the 40 thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For the record, Reba is younger than me, and I'm not yet 40 either. So I'm going to pay for that one. I am going to pay for that one. Gosh, how do you, how do you, where do we go from here? Yeah, that's right, Kathy. A friend loves at all times, Reba. And a brother or sister is born for adversity. I just built myself a good sermon illustration there. Um, my goodness. All right, well, a while back, um, at one of our married people get-togethers, we heard some teaching from Andy Stanley that I think illustrates Proverbs 17, 17 in, in a powerful way. Because all of us, I think, have experienced this, but all of us haven't, we, we've, we've not done this well. I think for every one of us, we all have expectations of the people. Hold that up, Jaden, but let them read the word. There you go. All of us have expectations for the people that we are in relationship with. We have expectations of our spouse. We have expectations of our parents. We have expectations of our kids. We have expectations of our employer. We have expectations of our employees. We have expectations of our teachers. Uh, they have <laughs> expectations of their students. We all have expectations of the people we live in a relationship with. But with all the people that we're in relationship with, we have their behavior, right? So there's expectations, but then there's the behavior of the person, of the student, of the child, of the parent, of the spouse, of the neighbor, right? And so there's always a gap uh, when, there's, when there's something going on in the relationship, a gap between our expectations and their behavior. And so... Let's use a real-life example where there is a gap between someone's expectations and someone's behavior. So what if, what if you mistakenly, let's imagine that I, let's pick on me, mistakenly um, thought that someone was over 40, okay? <laughs> let's just go there. Let's do, let's do this, right? So imagine if, if I, and let's imagine it was Reba, okay? So... <laughs> So let's imagine that, that I thought Reba, for a second, was over 40 because I wasn't thinking. Reba has an expectation that, that I would be thoughtful and that I would remember that she is well under 40, okay? But my behavior said otherwise because I said, hey, I need someone that's over 40. Reba, you should come up. And, okay, so what can Reba put in the gap between her expectations and my behavior? Well, she can think the worst, right? She can think that Adam, he is an idiot. Like, doesn't Adam know that I'm younger than him? Adam, he never thinks about other people. Adam, I don't know what he's doing when he's up front. He, he should know that I am well under 40. She can believe the worst about me and be like, that's just Adam being Adam, and this is why I don't like him. Or she can put in the gap between her expectations and my behavior the best. Like, man, it's really hard to think when you're in front of a hundred and some people and thinking on the fly, and it's really hard for Adam sometimes to, to like think in his head while he's already thinking about the next thing that needs to be done. So I'm going to cut Adam a little slack because I believe the best about Adam. It shows up in other ways too. Sometimes let's say that, can I pick on you, Ben? I mean, you're a senior and you're leaving us anyway. So if you get mad, right? It's like <laughs> no loss there. Um, just kidding. But, but let's just say that, that Melanie... Ben's special someone, uh, has a certain expectation of, of Ben that Ben is going to pick her up on time. How many of you appreciate punctual people? How many of you are not punctual people? Okay, so uh, they're, they're, right, and how many of you are not self-aware? You don't know, right? And so um, Melanie has an expectation of Ben that he will be there at five o'clock to pick her up to take her out, and Ben shows up at six o'clock. He is an hour, right? You know what it's like. He's an hour late. She expects him to be on time, but his behavior says otherwise. She could put in that gap the worst. She could be like, that Ben, he, he, he just can't tell time. That Ben, he is so irresponsible. Ben, he's always disappointing me. And, and then what happens sometimes when we think the worst is, maybe you do this, it just starts to spiral out of control, right? Like, Ben, he's no good. Ben, he, he even hates puppies. Uh, and <laughs> you've played that game, haven't you, with... with thinking the worst about somebody, and all of a sudden that person becomes a monster just because they were, okay, an hour late, I feel like you are a monster, but, but even so, even so, it probably is best to believe the best about Ben. Boy, I wonder, wonder what Ben has going on, or, or maybe there's something going on behind the scenes in his life that's especially challenging, or, or maybe 
this time thing uh, and, and being punctual is something that I can h- help him with in, in a loving way. See, there's like a better way, Jaden, between our, uh, do, yes, uh, in the gap between our expectations and behavior. We don't want to put the worst there. We actually want to put the best there. Give them a big hand if you would. They were very patient. Again, it illustrates the truth of, of this proverb, I think, in, in, in a great way. And so what do we do? We choose to love through those hard times. When there's a gap between, someone's, uh, between our expectations and someone's behavior, we choose love. We choose to believe the best about the other person. And it doesn't matter if it's our spouse. It doesn't matter if it's our parents, our kids. It doesn't matter if it's our extended family. It's our employer. It's our employees. It's our teacher. It's our students. It doesn't matter if it's a, a, a coworker. It doesn't matter if it's a neighbor. It doesn't matter if it's someone we go to church with. We choose to love through the hard time. We choose to believe the best about the other person. And the good news is that Jesus himself and enables us to have these kind of relationships. It is Jesus who hasn't one time given up on us despite all of our failures, despite all of our brokenness, despite all of our sins against him. And we, we, the ones who bear his name, don't give up on the people in our lives when they fail to meet our expectations or they're hard to love. Instead, we commit to walk through the pain, through the difficulty, through the ugliness of it all together. And so the question is, what do you most often uh, fill in the gap between your expectations and someone else's behavior? Like, what's your default? Is it the worst or is it the best? And how does the good news of Jesus, how does Jesus himself inform what you should fill that gap in with? And how does God want to change your heart and my heart? Uh, How does he want to change our hearts toward the difficult people in our lives? And how are we investing in our relationships in, in such a way that we can love one another at, at a deeper level. Again, a friend loves at all times, and a brother or sister is born for adversity. Jesus shows us how it's done. And then from here, we go to our last proverb, and it's Proverbs 19.11. And if the first one was, was difficult and the second one was hard too, this one might be the hardest for all of us. And so I want to park here for, for a minute or two, uh, because he, here's what it says. Uh, a person's wisdom uh, yields patience, and it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. We talked last week how, how we struggle with, with patience, and it's hard for us to, to be patient with circumstances, but it's even harder for us to be patient with people. People disappoint us, people, they, they, they sin against us, they hurt us, they do fail to meet our, our expectations. But a person who is wise, a person who, who really understands God's truth, a person who, who really understands what it's like to, and what it means to live out this truth in light of our faith in Jesus, we actually produce or are able to live out this sort of patience or forbearance toward one another. And then the second part, which is even harder than the first, I think, it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Or as the Message Bible says, smart people know how to hold their tongue. Their grandeur is to forgive and forget. And isn't it true that one of the hardest things for us to do as human beings is to forgive someone who hurt us? The reality is people hurt people, and sometimes we're the one who hurts people, and sometimes we're the recipient of the hurt. But it's highly likely that in your life at some point you've been wounded by a thoughtless remark from someone else or an uncaring attitude or an unfulfilled expectation, or or maybe you've been deeply hurt by something far more significant It's hard to overlook an offense, and it's really hard to overlook an offensive offense. And so how do we do that? Again, this proverb is interpreted through the good news of Jesus as well. It's interpreted through the gospel. That as Jesus came to our rescue and offered us forgiveness, so we forgive out of the abundance of forgiveness that we've experienced through Jesus. That forgiveness for your sin and my sin ultimately came through a cross, and Jesus sacrificed on it. And so... In all of our imperfections and disobedience, and since that can be forgiven, out of all that, we have everything we need to be able to forgive the people and their offenses toward us. See, this is where forgiveness changes for us. And that's a repeated theme in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ uh, God forgave you. And I like how kindness and compassion are linked to forgiveness and maybe you found this to be true, that, that when you're in conflict with someone and you have that gap between the, your expectations and their behavior, um, it's really hard sometimes to be kind to someone who's offended you. No? Or it's not just me, right? Um, 
And sometimes it's really hard to be compassionate towards someone who's uh, offended you or who's hurt you. But yet forgiveness, it actually comes out of the abundance of forgiveness that we've experienced through our own faith in Jesus. As through our faith in Jesus alone, all of our, our sin has been erased and we've been freed from its power and its, its penalty. And our goal as followers of Jesus who bear the name of Jesus, our goal is to imitate Jesus. And so since he forgave us, we are men and women, we are boys and girls who are able to forgive others. It's a powerful truth. And then it's illustrated through Peter's words in 1 Peter chapter 4, where it says there, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And just like God's love through his son Jesus, as Jesus shed his blood on the cross, that, that, that covered over the multitude of sins that you committed against God. As we draw from that love and that forgiveness from Jesus and extend it to other people, it's able to cover over a multitude of offenses where people have offended and hurt us. You can see how, how this shapes our understanding of Proverbs 19, 11. And see, what happens is um, the overlooking of an offense is, is really choosing not to make the other person pay for their sin against us. Anytime there's an offense toward us, there's a price that needs to be paid. There's a debt that's owed to us. They owe us something. Maybe it's an apology. Maybe it's an admission of, of some sort, but something is owed. There's a debt to be paid. And if that debt's going to be paid, we have a choice to make regarding the payment because someone's got to pay it. Either we're going to make that other person pay, we'll take the payments from them, or we'll decide that we will pay for their sin and we will make the payment ourselves. So either we take the payments or we make them. And, and you, I'm sure, have experienced how this, this works, right? Because we are really good payment takers. We're, we're, we're notorious for making people pay for their offenses to us. So someone offends you in some way, Ben, you're late to pick up Melanie and she could be on that whole date when you're an hour late. She could be totally distant. And really, I feel like maybe she'd be entitled to feel that way if you were an hour late. But uh, let's say you were 15 minutes late. She could make you pay and, and she could be distant from you. Or she could say some really harsh things, some unkind words. Or she could kind of go off from that, that date and, and uh, she can go tell all of her friends just what a jerk you are and make you pay that way. She can make you pay by keep bringing up all those offenses, all the times you've been laid. And uh, she can make you pay just by herself dwelling on the wrong. Or she can make you pay by... A, maybe making you feel some sort of emotional pain, making you feel bad about yourself, or she can make you pay by uh, lashing out, or maybe she can make you pay by seeking revenge and uh, maybe showing up late when it's her turn to pick you up. Or she can make you pay, boy, Ben, I'm really picking on you. I'm so sorry. But she can make you pay by uh, having these imaginary conversations with you in her mind on that date. Those kind of conversations that all of us have had where you know, we win the argument with the person that offended us. How many of you have ever done that? You always win the argument, don't you, when it's the imaginary one in your head? It doesn't really ever play out that way in, in real life. But, but what, what might be true of Ben and Melanie is very likely true of all of us that we are really good at taking payments from the people who offend us or who hurt us or who don't meet our expectations. But forgiveness is canceling that debt that's owed to us. When we forgive someone, we relinquish our right to make them repay that debt. And since Jesus is our model and we profess to have experienced this, this forgiveness of a debt that we could not pay to God, since we have received from God what we do not deserve, that new life through God's Son, we are able then to release people through those debts that are owed to us. That instead of taking payments from people, we start making them. Because in that deposit box of our heart, we have all that we need to be able to make those payments for other people because Jesus has given us all we need to be able to forgive the people around us. Forgiven people forgive people. Now, I realize that there are people in this room who've been hurt in some very deep and personal ways. And let me say a few things about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not denying that the offense happened. Um, it did happen. And... Um, you need to call it what it is. Um, forgiveness is also not condoning the behavior. So in forgiveness, when we forgive someone, we're not saying that what they did was okay because it wasn't. Forgiveness is also not enabling sin, that it doesn't make you a doormat for that person or for their sin. 
Forgiveness is also not the same thing as forgetting that there are scars, there are memories, there is work that still needs to be done. But forgiveness is being willing to open up that door to make sure that, that your heart uh, becomes right with God and then becomes right with that person. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation. It takes two willing people to reconcile. Forgiveness is, is between you and God and really how you see that other person. That other person might not ever ask for forgiveness. That other person might not ever um, do what they need to do to um, enter into a, a healthy, uh, life-giving relationship with you. But forgiveness is making sure that your heart is right with God. That your posture um, is the posture that would reflect the, the, the heart, the attitude, the behavior of Jesus. There's a lot of freedom in forgiveness. And that's a process, forgiveness. It's a process. But it starts with the willingness to simply open the door and begin to enter into that journey. Sometimes we're able to make those payments for that other person in one big payment, and we're able just to overlook that offense right away. Other times, it's, it's a process, a lengthy process of, of making that payment and, and choosing not to continue taking the payments for the other person or from the other person. And so if we want to be careful in conflict, if we want life-giving relationships, we need to decide to be men and women who overlook offenses. And I guess my question is, is there an offense that you need to overlook and is there an offense that I need to overlook? And listen, I have my own share of, of this kind of baggage, just like I would imagine you do as well. But I don't think that withholding forgiveness from other people when we've been forgiven for so much, I just don't think withholding that forgiveness is worth it. And I definitely don't think that it reflects the, the character and heart of, of Jesus. And so I, I'll ask you the questions that, that I need to ask myself. So are you and I trying to hold someone hostage right now with our attitude toward them because they offended us in some way? Are we taking payments from them? Maybe by being cold or distant or by having these imaginary conversations with them in our minds where we win the argument? Are we taking payments by making them feel bad about themselves? Are we taking, making them, uh, taking payments by uh, making them, uh, you fill in the, the gap? Um, how you take payments might be different than how I take payments from people. But if we're determined to punish the people around us for something that they said or did, um, there's probably and there is some more work that God might want to do in your heart and mind. And I realize that, that some in this room have been hurt in just unspeakable kinds of ways. And, and, and what I'm talking about here and deciding to overlook offenses does not take away from the grief, the, the, just the, the, the grievousness of that, that sin or that offense. But there's something that begins to change when our hearts begin to change, when we make that decision to enter into the process hard as it may be. So what would it look like for you and I to, on the other side of conflict, um, handle that conflict in a way that makes us better instead of bitter? What would it look like for us to handle that conflict in a way that is redemptive rather than uh, destructive. And maybe for you, it's simply to memorize one of these Proverbs and to keep it somewhere where you can easily refer to it when, uh, when there's an offense or to keep it somewhere when, uh, for when you start to struggle with that process of forgiveness of someone else. Maybe for you, it's simply to start praying for that person that you're at odds with or those people that you're at odds with. Maybe it's, it's, it's time for you to, to pray about your heart toward the people that you're at odds with. There's something powerful that happens when we open ourselves up to to the Spirit, to, to God's Spirit, to the Holy Spirit, as we allow Him to, to, to do a work inside of us. Maybe it's to ask that trusted friend, that question we've been talking about in this whole series, to ask them, what's it like to be on the other side of me? What do you see in my life that doesn't align with uh, this sort of uh, attitude toward other people? Maybe it's just simply to pursue forgiveness with someone that's offended you, or maybe it's to pursue forgiveness from someone that you've offended or, or, or you've hurt. It's amazing how powerful just those simple words are, I'm sorry, or um, I forgive you, or I was wrong. Those, those are words that uh, really do um, matter and really do mean the world. 
But all of this comes through faith in Jesus. We're not going to have healthy relationships. We're not going to experience relationships as everything they ought to be and everything they were created for outside of our faith in Jesus. That it's Jesus who makes this possible. It's Jesus who enables us to forgive. It's Jesus who enables us to experience forgiveness. It's Jesus who enables us to make payments for people rather than taking payments from people. And if you're here today and you've never put your hope in Jesus, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus alone to forgive you for your sins and to make you a new person, that's the very first step that you need to take. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we owe a debt to God because of our sin, our crimes against God. God loves us so much that he sent us on Jesus to pay for those crimes, to pay the debt that you and I owe. And because he has forgiven us and made a way for us through our simple faith in Jesus, confessing our sin, declaring our faith in Jesus alone, new life comes. And out of the abundance of forgiveness that we've experienced, we're able to forgive. Because Jesus forgave, we can forgive. Forgiven people forgive people. And it begins and it ends with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, today as we come to your word, um, Lord, we're humbled by it. Because I think all of us in this room, um, all of us who've have heard this message from your word, all of us have um, been the offender all of us have struggled to overlook an offense. All of us have struggled to offer forgiveness. All of us have been hurt by people, deeply hurt. All of us have felt that, that nagging pain. We're humbled too, Lord, because we all have expectations of people. And um, we realize that, that sometimes when people's behavior doesn't match with our expectations, we, we struggle. And we don't always believe the best, but rather we think the worst and... Lord, your word has humbled us today by drawing us back to the heart of your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, um, our prayer is that as we apply these truths, that your spirit would, would do a work in us. Lord, that you would open our eyes to those areas of, of our hearts where um, maybe we're not as quick to own our failures. Lord, give us a spirit of humility and even a spirit of courage to be vulnerable with one another when, when we do the offending to ask that question, will you forgive me? Or to be able to say, I was wrong. Or to be able to say, I'm sorry. Would we confess that sometimes we, we're not always loving through conflict and through difficulty? Sometimes, Lord, when there's um, that kind of adversity that comes from the outside, we're not very present in the relationship. So, Lord, give us eyes to see those opportunities and, and give us courage to join you in them. And Lord, we admit that there are times when the conflict comes from the inside and we don't always lean into the relationship when there's offenses. Help us to do that. Help us to be people who are able to overlook those offenses. Not to be people who become doormats. Not to become um, people who just sort of live life numb to hurt when it, when it comes. But Lord, help us just to be people who depend on Jesus to offer forgiveness. Help us to be people who take steps toward people when, when they do offend us. And oh Lord, out of the abundance of forgiveness that you've offered us, may we be men and women, may we be boys and girls who, who are known as people who forgive the best of the worst of people. Lord, as you do your work in us and you do your work around us, as you do your work through us, Lord, help us to live lives that radiate your glory. Lord, help us to live lives that, that point people to Jesus. Lord, we love you, and we can't wait to see how you are faithful to us as we seek to apply this truth to our lives. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.